Hey everybody, so there is a full interview with Karen McDonald, the prosecutor on James Crumbly's case. She speaks on the verdict. Um, you know, there's, there's a few things I'd like to talk about and I, maybe there'll be a little bit of jumping around obviously, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the guilty verdict is why we're here. And you talked about when you filed the charges, why you had filed them and what it meant to the community and why you believed that there was a strong case and, uh, two juries agreed with you. Um, you know, as you were delivering those closing arguments, there was a lot of pressure and a lot of, a lot of eyeballs watching what was happening. Um, what was going through your mind as you were um, as you were speaking to the jury one final time? What was going through your mind? You know, I, I'm not I'm not going to say that the, the the pressure and the the intensity of it and just the sheer um, grit required to do two trials in a short period of time after two and a half years of of preparation and several hearings, both in these cases and the shooter's case, um, did not have an impact in, on me, including uh, heavily, heavily scrutinized um, by every media outlet. Um, however, when you're standing in front of a jury, when I was standing in front of the jury, that last moment I had to address them in rebuttal, I really, the only real pressure and that I that I feel is the, the incredible weight and obligation I have on behalf of the the four parents that were sitting in the courtroom whose children were, were killed that day. You know, it's about those victims. It's about those kids. And there has been just repeated, repeated attempts by all sorts of people, including the defendants and their lawyers, to distract and, and say that's not what it is about. Um, but it is. It is. Because the the, the truth is, one small effort could have saved their lives. I'm glad you said that, um, because it makes me think of what I wanted to ask you immediately following the demonstration you gave um, in rebuttal. Why demonstrate to the jury how to apply a gun lock? You know, I think there are a lot of lawyers across the country, litigators, prosecutors, some maybe in my office, who would have probably chosen the safer route, which is to not uh, attempt to demonstrate something like that in front of a jury, um, just in case something might go wrong. But I, you know, I did that for the same reason I've done everything in this case and every decision may not have gotten everything right, but my compass has always been um, complete transparency and, and the truth. Whether whether it makes the case stronger, weaker, it doesn't matter. Whether it looks makes me look bad, worse, it doesn't matter. The point is, I'm not in law enforcement. I I don't. I'm not an expert in firearms. But it took me around ten seconds to apply the cable lock, and I just don't think that there was a way to really um, communicate that or show that um, by just explaining it. And I don't think it's as powerful having somebody from law enforcement do it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a mom, um, and I don't have to, you know, I'm, I'm not big in stature. I'm, I'm petite, and I don't have a lot of physical strength, and none is needed. You, in less than 10 seconds, you can pick that, that gun up and install a cable lock in, in less than 10 seconds. And I think that was it's extremely powerful. It was extremely powerful when I tried to do it for the first time in preparation and how easy it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you prosecuted Jennifer and James Crumbly. Were you able to, I guess, between the two parents, was one case more difficult for you than the other? Every single thing that has happened since November 30th has been difficult. So the answer to that is no. Okay. Um, and to know that the, the family was there every step of the moment. I, I, I didn't necessarily see you turn around and look at them constantly, but you knew that they were there, knowing that the four families who lost children were sitting there watching every day. What did that mean to you? You know, there's, there's, 
there's this perception that what's played out on camera in the courtroom or in pleadings is all that happens. And, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about work everybody was, was doing and, and the time. But the very first thing Mark Keast and I did when we left the courtroom, after we left the courtroom every single day, was go talk to those four parents who were in our comfort room, which we provide so that they have a place to, to, to be, and sit down with them and, and answer all of their questions about what happened that day and explain to them what we could. That's, you know, we, we didn't, we weren't, we didn't rush back to the office and roll up our sleeves and get to work. There was a lot of work to do, but the very first obligation we have was to talk to those parents. And we did that every single day, sometimes twice a day. Um, so they were, so the answer to your question is it was everything. It was everything that, that, that obligation to, to try to explain sometimes the unexplainable that that's our job. Those are the people that we answer to. Not, not a jury, not even the judge. We answer to the people who are sitting in that courtroom and who lost their kids. And they are in a situation where things don't quite seem right or fair sometimes. And we have to, we have to explain that. What if it were your child? You need somebody, we have victim advocates, but they wanna hear from us. And so, yeah. That, I felt a lot of pressure. Mark Keith felt a lot of pressure. And it wasn't because we were worried about our reputations. I'll tell you that much. Um, in, in court, the uh, talk about the jury for a minute. Um, sitting in court, I could tell that the jury was visibly moved by the video of the actual mass shooting. Why did you feel you needed to show it in both cases against the parents? Um, it's a homicide trial and what happened in that school that day and the way that it was carried out, the shooter's proficiency in weapons, the, the proficiency in weapons and ammo that were purchased for him by the defendants are absolutely critical and relevant. And, you know, there's no question it's moving. There's no question that it is, it causes people a lot of intense feelings, but that is not, that is not a, a reason not to provide context about the actual crime that took place. When people look at this case and they say, well, this, you know, I've heard it and I'm sure you've heard it said, uh, experts on TV have constantly talked about how this could change how prosecutions are viewed going forward. But I haven't heard you say every case could end up like this moving forward. You've not said that. Why is that? You haven't heard me say that, and you haven't heard me say that I think that these prosecutions um, are a, a huge moment of policy shift that opens up the floodgates to a lot of other prosecutions. Let me be clear and say what I've said since the beginning. I don't think parents should be responsible for what their children do. Children do. I, I have children. I don't want to be responsible for everything they do. I don't think it sends a message to parents because most most parents, because most parents, most of us do not need that message. Most of us, the majority of us know that it is not only our obligation, but our, our absolute privilege and, and why we're parents to exercise basic ordinary care. Most of us do not need to be told that if you're called to the school and you see, help me, blood everywhere, the world is ending with a gun drawn that precisely matches the gun that you had just purchased for your troubled son, and you never tell them that you did it, and then when asked to get him help, you just leave. Most of us don't need a message like that, and that's exactly why they were charged, because they're, 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 they did not meet their basic ordinary care that a reasonable person would know, and, 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 uh, Four children died as a result of that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not out here taking a victory lap. There is nothing to celebrate. However, I do think not charging that case would have been a real, it, 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 it would be completely unjust. Um, a key witness in your case was uh, ATF agent Brett Brandon. And I thought it was interesting listening to him. He was times he was offering his expertise and when it came to the drawing he was asked about then he gave an interesting answer that he he believed 
that was not just a drawing of a sad kid, but um, did you know that Brett Brandon would testify that that drawing was a prediction of the massacre that was about to unfold? Well, certainly I, I know what my witnesses are, I, hopefully I know what they're gonna to testify to. Um, in terms of those precise words, no, but I know that it was Brett Brandon and other members of the, the Sheriff's Department that day that when these events unfolded like they did and they saw that drawing and they saw text messages, they did what any reasonable person would do, not even law enforcement, and say, this is, something is not right. This is just not right. Mm -hmm. These, these set of, this set of facts is so outside the bounds of what we see every day and are, are completely egregious. And, you know, I, I want to point out that not just one jury agreed with that, too, as well as the Court of Appeals in a published opinion um, that that absolutely uh, completely um, supported this idea that these are rare, rare facts and, and it should be a rare case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I don't know about other prosecutors, but I can tell you this. We don't need to go looking for more cases to charge. We have plenty that are uh, submitted to us every day, and we're we we don't we're not out looking for parents to to charge for what their kids do, but it it is also our duty when faced with facts that are so egregious of somebody um, in their complete gross negligence causing the death of four kids that we're gonna we're gonna do what we're gonna do our job. Um, one of the differences that is a striking difference in the cases. Um, Deals with the fact that Jennifer Crumbly testified and James did not. Um, how did it change things for you when the shooter's mother took the stand and the shooter's father did not? You know, uh, you build your case for months and months and months and you prepare every single thing. But anybody who, who, who litigates knows that trial, a trial is a, a living thing and it changes um, quickly. And so we were prepared for anything. We were prepared if, if one of them took the stand or, or both or, or they didn't. Um, the facts remain the same. And we were confident that we, we could meet our burden. Okay. Um, in terms of what was the biggest challenge for you, you've been an attorney, you've been a judge. Um, I thought it was interesting in the, in the case against the shooter or in the hearing against the shooter that you said you sat in all the different seats in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, what was the biggest challenge for you personally in taking on this case? Personally, the biggest challenge is despite the attention and all the hard work and um, just the sheer volume of hours and dedication, um, lots of that time spent with victims, families, moms and dads. Uh, even if we succeed and we did, the hardest part for me is that um, I didn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't take away anything from these parents. It doesn't make them feel better. It doesn't, we receive justice, they receive justice, but they're still going home without their kids. And so I think for me, it's, you're expected to to feel good or successful or joy, and it's just it just doesn't come because they don't feel any better. They mm -hmm. just don't. I would change gears now and talk about. Go some water. Yep. Um, okay. <clears throat> um. It's a natural question after something like this, who else might be charged? Is there any agreement in place with anyone that they will not be prosecuted? You know, the media reports or anyone reporting that there was some agreement, uh, they're just absolutely false. There was absolutely no protection from prosecution for anyone. And the, the, the witnesses who testified were, were promised nothing and they were given nothing. And I have said to, to these witnesses the same thing I've said to parents, the same thing I've said to any reporter that asked me. At this moment, given all of the evidence and all of the testimony, I am not considering, uh, nor is there a viable criminal charge 
against the individuals who testified um, or the witnesses for that matter. I do, however, think that that there has more needs to be done in accountability, and I stand with the four parents um, in that in in that effort because they really haven't received it. There's a lot the school district has not done. There is even more they haven't disclosed, um, and they need they need answers because they want to ultimately prevent what. Uh, from something like this happening again. And you can't prevent it if you don't really know what happened or if you have people too concer concerned with protecting their, their interests than finding out the truth. But I, I wanna go back to, um, to also say that we, we comply with the court rules and the case law to a T. And we are, we are required to, to allow the other side information if we promise anything in exchange for anybody's testimony, and we did not. So, um, you know, I a letter. Sure, the specific thing I'll ask, um, and I know there's limits to what you can say, but mm -hmm. um, a letter was given to a counselor and a dean of students to say that what they told you would not be used against them, um, which not, is a standard letter. Not, not exactly. Uh, their attorneys asked for um, that letter, which is very standard in, in many, many cases. The difference here is that usually it's not a, a, um, a cooperating witness. They were always cooperating. They never refused to sit down with us. Um, their lawyers wanted some, some agreement that what they said in, in our initial meeting wouldn't be used if we chose to prosecute. But the agreement actually states, and any lawyer who does criminal defense will tell you this, um, there, there was, you may be prosecuted. Um, and I stand by that decision because I want I I wanted and needed to understand what those witnesses were going to testify to. They were the witnesses that were there in that meeting that day, and nothing they said was ever inconsistent at all with exactly what they testified to. And in addition, nothing they said was um, incriminating to them pursuant to in terms of a criminal charge, and it certainly wasn't exculpatory for the defendants. It wasn't in favor of the defendants at all. Was so it, was it when you, you're using that term, was that something that you had to share with the defense? No, we are not required to. We, the only thing required to give to the defense, and rightly so, I stand by that. I insist that our assistant prosecutors do that, is, is any agreement we've made with a, with a witness that gives them a plea deal or immunity in exchange for their testimony under oath to prove our case. That was not done. It was not done. I, I, I would never do it because that's, that's, I would never do that. Sure. I, at I that, at that, if somebody's going to cooperate, they're going to cooperate. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to promise them anything, particularly in this, in this case. I want, um, I want to talk a little bit about a timeline uh, that involves some threats that were also made public uh, by another outlet. Um, you um, are aware that there were some threats made by the defendant. Um, it's become known that threats were made by the defendant dating back to 2022. Um, at what point did you make the court aware of that? It's important to note that we did not bring this to the media. In fact, if, if we had an intent to do that, we could have just filed a motion about those security concerns, but that's what ultimately these were. My team brought to court security, the, um, the, the deputies and the captain in charge of court security and the court as early as February that physical threats were being made by James Crumbly in jail calls um, against me personally. Lots of other threats about my career and all of that, but also physical threats. And, and you know, I've, I've shared those with you and um, they speak for themselves. How, and look, I absolutely support what they did. It was brought, it was brought to the, the, the deputies and the court um, in February. It was again, then addressed, uh, addressed the, before the first day of trial that morning. Um, it was then addressed based on the court's um, instruction uh, later that the next day and then later that day. We did not put on the record what it was. Um, but listen, James Crumbly threatened me physically, and he's going to be in a courtroom three feet away from me, unshackled and, un, you know, 
for days that we have an obligation to to protect not just me but any of the prosecutors in the courtroom and the witnesses and the judge and why would why would um i don't think you can answer this but you have a lot of experience so maybe some insight um did james crumbly know he was being recorded when he made those statements absolutely he he absolutely he actually said that he hoped i was listening he hoped i was listening when he threatened me physically and do you um, think he meant to intimidate you or prevent you from doing your work it's important to note that the the in addition to all the other inaccurate facts one of which is that they only occurred in 2023 the one of the most disturbing threats was uh january of 24. so that was actually the same month that the first day of trial was set for one of the defendants so um i consider that recent uh i don't i i would never ever uh, comment on what James Crumbly thinks or wants or does or doesn't want. I don't care, but I'm not going to let anything stop me uh, from from prosecuting and advocating for victims. And I also just think this is this is a distraction to what to what we really should be talking about, um, which is why we don't bring those things out in the open for people to focus on it and media to report on it because. We're here because two juries found those two defendants guilty as charged. And they did so based on what happened in that school today and their actions and their inactions, which caused four kids to be murdered in school. That is why we are here. And that is why we are still going to be here. We're still gonna be going into court every day, just like every assistant prosecutor in my office and do what we what our, our job is. And that is to protect victims and we, we also are entitled to basic security if there is a threat to that security. Well said. Um, was there anything else you wa wanted to talk about? No. All right. So she did very good. She answered a lot of people's questions. And now we know exactly what the threats were. And she is a very strong person for standing in that courtroom and going on with the trial as, you know, I expected her to. And I, <clears throat> I will definitely go live when they do sentencing on April 9th, which both of them are going to be sentenced on the same day. Thank you guys for watching. Please hit the like button. And I will keep you guys updated with what the parents are doing because they are trying to get the school to be accountable and to change policies. Thank you guys again for watching. Hit that like button, comment below, and thank you. I will see you guys soon. Bye, guys.